On today's episode of You Asked, how can you find out if you're getting 4K or HDR on your TV? Why is Dolby Atmos music so hard to get? Are there any decent universal remotes anymore? All of that and more coming right up. Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and this is You Asked, the show where I answer questions that you asked in hopes that I can help you and others who have similar tech questions. If you've got a question for me, please send it to you asked at digitaltrends.com and let's see if your question gets picked to be answered on the show. And let me just emphasize real quick here that your question has its best shot of getting answered if you send it to that you asked email because my email and DMs are absolutely overwhelmed and it's hard to filter through those. Increasingly, I'm just relying on that email box to find questions to answer. I love talking with you all on social media when I can, but when it comes to this show, when it's time to sit down and find the questions, I'm going straight to that inbox. So please use it, tell a friend in need, and guys, thanks for sending the questions. I wish I could answer all of them, but we can only fit so many in a show. Speaking of, I'm wasting valuable time, so let's get to it. We'll start with one that came in from John Engstrom, who, John, is this your second time getting a question answered? That's like VIP status, my dude. Anyway, John writes, just got a Sony X90L and was wondering how to get the TV to show me the resolution and the format of the input signal, HDMI or streaming app. Is there a button on the remote that will show me that info or possibly somewhere in the menu? I haven't found it yet, but it seems like it has to be there somewhere. John, you would think that button or menu item exists because those kinds of buttons and info screens used to be fairly common. But to the best of my knowledge, it does not anymore, at least not on Sony TVs. And honestly, anecdotally, I feel like most TV manufacturers have stopped making that kind of information available. Or if they do, it's buried deep in a menu somewhere. As with all things tech though, there are sometimes hacks we can use to figure it out, or at least give ourselves some assurances that we're getting the signal that we want. One of them involves having an AV receiver that can read the EDID, that's short for Extended Display Identification Data, and would provide you that info. Or you could spend thousands on a device like the ones Meridio makes for video professionals. I'm assuming you're not interested in any of that. So for the format, SDR, HDR, HDR10, Dolby Vision, HLG, all that stuff, the best way to find out what you're getting is to click this wrench icon on your Sony remote, then click picture and sound, scroll down to picture and click that, and then look in the upper right. If it's HDR, it'll say HDR. If it's SDR, it will say nothing. As for resolution, I don't have anything there for you. I mean, if you're on YouTube, you can check the resolution and even force it to the one that you want by clicking up, then going over to the settings cog icon and selecting the resolution. And then there's also the stats for nerd section, which you can access if you scroll down a bit further. This will tell you the resolution as well as the codec in use, the color space, etc. Sometimes apps will give you some control over the default video resolution you get. For instance, you can sign into your Netflix account on their website, click account, then click on your profile icon, then scroll down to playback settings and choose high as opposed to auto or some of the others. And this makes it such that you may get some buffering at first, but Netflix will play at the highest available quality. Not a great idea for those of you out there with bandwidth caps, by the way. Often 1080p HDR can be indiscernible from 4K HDR when all other factors are equal. But I digress. Each streaming service is gonna be different. But this reminds me of something that I really like about LG's TVs. They have a graphic that pops up when you start watching content that tells you quite clearly what the format is, even if it doesn't tell you what the resolution is. Anyway, I hope that is of some help, and I've reached out to Sony to find out if they'll share any secret tips on how to access this info on their modern TVs. I haven't found it yet. I'll pin a comment down below if I do get anything on that. Richie writes, I recently bought an Onkyo AVR and some new ceiling speakers, and I thought I could be up and running with Dolby Atmos Music, but it was not that easy. I thought because my receiver had Tidal built in, it would work easy, but no, I have a Roku Ultra with the Tidal app and it won't work. Long story short, I had to buy an Apple TV in order to get Dolby Atmos music to work. Why is it so hard to get Dolby Atmos music to work, especially since Dolby Atmos support seems to be everywhere? I feel like with phone casting and airplay, it should be easy, 
What's the deal with Atmos music being so hard to listen to? Richie, what can I say? But I know, right? It's kind of ridiculous. Apple, Tidal, and Amazon Music Unlimited all offer Atmos music as a feature. You would think that any device with apps for those services would offer the full suite of features, but they don't. I mean, not even close. I can understand if say the Tidal app in an AV receiver is just not powerful enough to be coded to coordinate with Tidal in a way that authorizes and receives the Atmos music encoded stream. Okay, but when you're talking about Roku and Google TV slash Android TV platforms, where the devices that run those platforms are super powerful, I think it should be a no-brainer. I think the reason why, say, the Tidal app on Roku doesn't work for Atmos music is probably a little different for why the Tidal app on an Amazon Fire TV Cube might not work. I can also see Amazon keeping its best features for its own hardware. But at the end of the day, as consumers, we don't really care about that, right? Guys, this is just one more reason that I keep recommending the Apple TV box. It is consistently the one device and platform where the most amount of stuff just works. It requires the least amount of workarounds. It's just the safest bet. And I think all that counts for a lot in the consumer electronics market. Look, if you can get Atmos music over Wi-Fi using the Sonos app controlling a Sonos Atmos sound system, but you can't get the same sort of experience using say a Samsung Atmos soundbar with a Samsung TV, without also jumping through a bunch of hoops, well, then I understand why folks might pay more for Sonos. I think people are willing to pay a premium for fewer hoops, fewer questions, and fewer frustrations. Anyway, I'm sorry getting Dolby Atmos music is hard, and I think it's dumb, especially when Dolby Atmos for movies and TV is at least, relatively speaking, so incredibly easy now. I mean, it's stupid, and I hate it too. Chad asks, what are the pros and cons to using an Apple Vision Pro as a home movie theater instead of buying a large project Dolby surround sound, etc.? Is it possible that this is the home theater of the future? Can this approach be cheaper and better quality than what the traditional home movie theater offers? So Chad, I'm glad you asked because I'm gonna do a whole video about this for everyone who doesn't tune into this particular show. I've been thinking about it for a while and I have a lot to say about it, but here's the short version. I think the Apple Vision Pro will provide amazing picture quality. I mean, if the pixel density is right, we're talking about close range video where no light intensity is lost over long distances, perfectly controlled ambient light levels. In other words, total darkness. The Vision Pro could offer the ultimate HDR video experience. And through noise canceling, computational audio enabled Apple AirPods Pro or AirPods Max, we already know we can get an incredible Dolby Atmos uh, and spatial audio experience. The quality will probably be outstanding. Here's the thing though, this is the one thing that will prevent the Apple Vision Pro from ever meaningfully compete with a home entertainment space. That little Apple Vision Pro home theater it's a theater for one, you're all by yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with enjoying content on your own. In fact, it sounds awesome in some instances, but just like watching a big sporting event with friends or in a crowd is often more exciting and to some of us more meaningful than watching alone, so too is watching movies and TV. There's something awesome about experiencing a movie together with friends or family. Speaking personally, some of my favorite life memories come from those shared experiences. Apple Vision Pro will never be able to fully replace those shared experiences. Sure, maybe you can look to your left and right and see avatars or even real life representations of your friends or family. Maybe you'll even be able to hear them if Apple integrates voice audio among participants. I'm betting they'll do exactly that. But that kind of experience will never be the same or as meaningful as observing the same space together. So a supplement to a conventional home entertainment rig, for sure. A replacement though, no shot. Ben writes, are there any universal remotes you recommend to control all the devices in a setup such as an AVR, TV, Blu-ray player, Apple TV? I seem to recall them being fairly popular a couple of years ago, even being capable of controlling smart TVs and smart devices like the Apple TV 4K. In your opinion, is there any good way to get around this rigmarole of juggling three different remotes just to watch one show, or is that a lost battle? So guys, let's all just take a moment of silence to mourn the passing of Logitech's Harmony remotes. May they rest in peace.
Cool, that awkward enough? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, so Ben, I am not aware of any decent universal remotes. Although I did see a new one somewhere that looked like it came from a startup. Actually, uh, let's look into that real quick. So yeah, I think this is it. It's a Kickstarter project, which I mean, I'm not endorsing this, not until I look deeper into it, but it's by Martin Borzak and he calls it the Yeo or the Yayo. Maybe we work on that name. Anyway, nobody has swooped in to fill the void that Logitech left. Yes, there are some killer remotes available for integrated systems like those made by Control 4, Savant, and Crestron, etc. But consumer level remotes like the Harmony brand no longer exist, at least as far as I'm aware. I mean, Wirecutter's top pick is the Sofa Baton, and that's number one out of two remotes on the list, guys, which I think tells us plenty. So why did Logitech get out of Universal Remotes? I'm gonna ask them. Logitech actually has headquarters across the river from me uh, for their UE division, but I suspect it's because sales declined as HDMI CEC implementation, even though it is buggy and problematic, allows us to control multiple devices with one remote. Like, I can control a TV, Blu-ray player, Apple TV, and even some PS5 features with one remote just through HDMI CEC, which I think pushed universal remotes to the margins. Once again, us enthusiasts find the big box consumer electronic space a very lonely place indeed. Which, if I had to guess, is why Martin Borzak is doing his thing. By the way, Martin, please shoot me an email. I'm about to blow your Kickstarter page up. Also, shout out to Garrett Arendt, who also emailed about remotes, specifically looking at the Yeo and the Sofa Baton. I see you, Garrett, in Germany. Jaime Martinez Gomez writes, I went to a store and the guy at the store told me that the LG C3 has Dolby Atmos built-in speakers. And when I heard it, it didn't sound precisely as Dolby Atmos. I just wanna know if they are telling me the truth or if there's any TV with Dolby Atmos built-in speakers. Because I also had the opportunity to try the A80L and the acoustic surface audio was amazing, but I think that isn't Dolby Atmos either. Okay, for those of you who have heard me say this many, many times already, I apologize. But Jaime, here's the deal. Dolby has decided to license the Dolby Atmos name to technologies that, in my opinion, do not really deliver what I think most folks familiar with Dolby Atmos are expecting. I love Dolby. I love the people there. I love Dolby Atmos. I love Dolby Atmos music. I have some really awesome things to say about Dolby Flex Connect in a video that's coming out this week. Much love to Dolby goes out from Caleb Dennison here. But, and I understand this may be a smart business decision, but I hate Hate. The most diabolical haters this side of the Mississippi. Hate that Dolby Atmos as a technology and brand has been so watered down to the point that a TV with some tiny dinky speakers that don't really deliver anything remotely close to high quality sound is getting the Dolby Atmos badge. I mean, call it Dolby Audio. Dolby is still a flex in the audio world. You can convey this TV has better than average sound quality by saying it has Dolby onboard sound. You don't have to use Dolby Atmos for that. But yeah, if it were up to me, and Dolby is probably just fine with it not being up to me, I would not slap the Dolby Atmos badge on any TV outside of just advertising the fact that it supports Dolby Atmos. Saying the speakers built into any TV deliver a meaningful Dolby Atmos experience is, I think, disingenuous and weakens the brand. And with that soapbox moment, we have reached the conclusion to another episode of You Asked. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I love your questions. Keep them coming. Drop me a comment down below, would you? I'll see you there. Slap this video with a like, subscribe and share if you wanna see more. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, here are two other videos I think you might like. any TV with Dolby Atmos built-in speakers because, <coughs> wow. I tried to hold that back, but I could not. Anyway, where was I?